You're listening to a podcast from thespoilist.com. Cyberspace, the new frontier. These are the voyages of the podcast First Contact. Its mission, to explore every episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. To seek out new viewers and have new conversations. To boldly view what many have viewed before. Welcome to First Contact, a podcast where three people have watched Star Trek The Next Generation and then tediously talk about it for around half an hour. I'm Andrew. I'm James. And I'm rapidly losing the will to live. I think you've done that joke already, Alex. (laughs) This week we have been watching Up the Long Ladder. It was written by Melinda M. Snodgrass and directed by Winrich Colby. It first aired the week of May 22nd, 1989. James, tell me all about this one. While on the way to a mapping mission we know it will never get to, the Enterprise receives a mysterious distress call, which could easily be mistaken for a game of space invaders. It turns out to be an ancient beacon from an Earth colony long since lost. On arriving at the planet... The Enterprise crew found an inexplicably small group of comedy Irish people and their farm animals. Picard is unsure what to do until one of the colonists suggests looking for the other half of the colony. Turns out that it was pretty easy to find, but this technologically advanced society has resorted to cloning, since they have such a small gene pool and are now dying. Could there possibly be a solution that ties it all up in a neat bow? Yes. Alex, what did you think of this episode? Well, as you know, I I like uh, deep philosophical episodes at times. I I like stuff that really explores moral quandaries or indeed just deals with some of the big questions. Um, So I I really appreciated uh, with this episode uh, to have an episode that through the use of uh, perhaps unintentional Radio 2 disc jockey lookalikes, we could address that age-old question of how would you like to know what it's like to wake up with Wogan? That's that's your takeaway from this? No, my takeaway is Chinese, but um, it was more interesting than the episode and it gave me food poisoning. American television has an interesting relationship with the Irish culture that you know a lot of Americans would consider themselves Irish. It's an American style accent, um, uh, and and it often pops up, and and never competently. I'd refer you to something like Heroes, which did Irish so wonderfully, and and here I feel they've really nailed Irishness. Simple folk who carry pigs around. And they're drunk all the time. Always drunk. The only surprising thing is that they didn't just go, potatoes, potatoes, potatoes. Though they did actually mention meat and potatoes as the only food that they eat. So they were pretty close. The US never does Irish well. Does it with its ho? Oh, hello, car by me, governor. Yes, I'm from Ireland, so I am. Yes, oh, hey, well, it, it, it's a remarkable variety of accents on display in this episode for what is meant to be Irish. A cornucopia of different accents, ranging from the Scottish to Welsh to English to well, to everything in between, really. Very rarely Irish. Yeah, it's it's just so cliched and stereotypical and just so rubbish. And because it's a, a white European culture, you can get away with it. And perhaps rightly so, 
but it's very lazy it's just lazy and it's weak and it's uncomfortable and it's not funny which is clearly what they were going for as well Uh, and it isn't it's like something out of a sitcom from long ago which wouldn't have been funny at the time either You've got the drunk father, you've got the feisty daughter. Uh, I suppose more on her later. That's what Riker said. And, and no other characters, really. It, it's just... I don't know what to say. You know when they're doing episodes that are patently offensive to a certain group of people? Like, they had the episode which was just the planet of the black people. Do you think that, you know, the, the black actors who were in the cast kind of said you know this is a bit odd really and i'm thinking the same this week did Col meany who is actually irish did he maybe go you know this is a bit insensitive you'd think he might but maybe he just wanted the paycheck safe assumption i find it baffling that these episodes like code of honor And this can get through. There is a massive... I mean, how long is it from script to screen? And nobody says anything until after it's aired. Well, Melinda Snodgrass, who we have praised before. We thought she did great work on A Measure of a Man. Interesting, if flawed, stuff in Pen Pals. There's some great stuff in Pen Pals, but surrounded by a lot of mediocrity here you wouldn't think it's the same writer you you really wouldn't but the original story was called send in the clones and it began as a look at immigration and prejudice but she admits that it lost a lot in the rewrites done by the writer's room i i think that would be fair i mean there, there is an interesting idea in here about I mean, there's a message about abortion which I think it's good that they explored that but everything else was terrible I mean I I would just like to address I mean we flagged it at the top of the show just how much the lead Irishman uh, does remind you of Terry Wogan and the reason I'd like to flag that is it's more interesting than anything to do with any of their plot, uh, to the extent that I I found myself watching it thinking, <laughs> wouldn't this be funny if that was all tell there, deciding which will be the present Mrs. Wogan. Um, to our American listeners, you might want to just leave for a little while now. But yes, it, it amused me more to imagine that this was Terry Wogan than it was to watch the episode. The thing that started to bug me, how small was this ship, this seed ship that was sent out? Yeah, how how small was it? Because we've got 200 there now. Now, I'm thinking over 200 years, any kind of healthy population should grow exponentially. You can't have 200 people. And I'm assuming there was at least 100 to start. There, there would surely be thousands of people on this planet by now just due to exponential population growth and hey they're irish hey yeah well that's the rapey comedy punchline to the episode isn't it terry wogan picks out his brides has it away and then reveals oh well most of us are actually sterile so you mean i slept with you for nothing that's about the size of it <laughs> about three and a quarter inches if i'm afraid uh i'm Sorry about that. (laughs) It's a bit cold. You see, I didn't think he looked that much like Terry Wogan at all. I can't decide if he did or not, or if I was just so baffled by the entire thing that I started to sort of mentally superimpose the face. Um, I mean, I... If you made that in this country... Now, if if this was today presenting exactly the same show in this country, or even, to be honest, at the time, you would be called up over here on so many offensive grounds for basically 
taking a show and having what would stereotypically be referred to as the Irish travellers invade space. Because that's sort of the way it's presented. Because it's not as if there's a, a time travel element at play here. It's not as if, you know, we're looking at a society from a while back. It's these Irish people are backward. I thought when it sort of first started, I really don't remember this episode at all. And I thought, oh, is it a sort of Amish in space kind of thing? People have decided to reject technology and stuff. But not really, because they sent out the distress call. And, you know, they were quite happy to be on the Enterprise with all the, the things that they had. And they'd gone out in a warp ship as part of the same voyage as the more advanced society. I'd like to say, as well, you just think all Irish people look the same. You think they all look like Terry Wogan. Therefore, you're a racist. No, some of them look like Patrick Kilty. Those are the women. I do think that this is a turning point. Yes, people are turning off. <laughs> as far as I can think of, every bad episode from this point onwards isn't offensive. So what you're saying is we've reached the racist watershed. Well, I, I would just like to say I don't feel that they handle Scottish culture particularly well in season 7. Which which episode was that? That'd be Sub Rosa, where Dr. Crusher falls in love with a candle. That's season 7, they couldn't be bothered in that season. Anyway, I, I suppose the other thing in this episode with the Irish culture is Riker's relationship with, with Brenna, the, the feisty daughter character who's really in charge because, ha, huh, what do men know and, and women are the great organisers? It isn't just that it's racist, it's also kind of sexist as well, isn't it? Kind of, it's incredibly. Yes. I mean, the episode ends basically with a celebration of the fact that the crew of the Enterprise and the main guy there and the main guy from the, the Clone Society have pimped out all of the women. And right down to Brenna or whatever her name was. And I suppose they might sort of say, oh, well, she had a choice. But her choice was, well, you can uh, you can sleep with three husbands or uh, you can leave your dad. Yeah. What do you want to do? Leave your dad or have sex with these three men. It's a bit blackmaily, isn't it, really? It is sexist in, in both ways, to be fair. The men are incompetent arseholes, and the women are there to be pimped out to the other men in the clone society. Oh well, but at least Riker gets his end away. He gets to wash her feet. Yeah, I've got to say, this episode had one of the most cringe-worthy bits of television. I think I have ever, ever come across. And I realised that that was perhaps a horrible choice of phrase. But it's the exchange that goes, Will, is something wrong? What do you mean? Do you not like girls? Of course I do. Oh, is there a sudden technique to this foot washing? Well, you generally start at the top and work your way down. I think I could get used to that. Filth. And we've not even talked about the clones. Clones? Clones? Cones? Combs? Domes? Bones? McCoy? Homes? Phones? Zones? Loans? Bones? Tones? That's right, clones. This episode featured a lot about cloning, and it's used in a proper Star Trek way. It's used as a, a metaphor for abortion. I'm in control of my body, says Riker, because only a man can say that kind of thing. What did you think of that part of the episode? Well, I mean, this was the one interesting bit of the episode, really, wasn't it? It was just a bit ham-fisted all over. But would, would you say that, Andrew? Would you say it's intentional by Melinda Snodgrass to make it Riker saying it because she felt that if it was a woman saying it, it would be perhaps too obvious or perhaps offensive to a lot of people at the time, or even now. Even at the time, it did upset um, some pro-life people. 
I don't think it's particularly subtle, but I would guess that would probably be a reason for having Riker saying it to try and make it a bit more subtle. But I would say it's it's pretty obvious. I thought that she was getting Riker to say it to make it to to be able to relay it to people the the fact that why she she thinks there should be abortion because this is the equivalent for a man and i thought that it it makes it a stronger point by having it be riker uh, this bit and this as an idea it, it is good and this is interesting and actually if they'd landed on this planet first would that have actually held our interest more because th- th- that's a serious point they're making and something star trek should be doing star trek at its best explores social ideas instead we've got basically a really comedy heavy episode and then sort of an idea and then sort of back to comedy at the end and you can't have these big tonal shifts you just can't i'm not saying the tone has to be the same across the whole series but you cannot use a comedy episode to try and make a, a serious and interesting point no and i mean there was an interesting episode to be had and you saw the germ of it it was just never followed through on you could have had the episode about the idea of a clone society and you could have had played with that idea that the cloning has continued for so long that that is the standard way of reproduction with them and what moral implications does that have uh, for the Enterprise crew uh, in trying to force them to breed basically do they leave them to die? You know, there's some interesting stuff to be done there. And as you say, there's uh, the uh, the abortion undertones, which I, I feel maybe we've thought about more than was thought about during the scripting, to be honest. But, yeah, it's it it's pissed away. Part of me thinks Melinda Snodgrass had her hands tied, I think. She she couldn't have done another measure of a man here. I think that Maurice Hurley was controlling the show to the point where she knew she would not get an episode that was serious about abortion. It needed to have this unfortunate comedy element, which was also, as we will find out later by some quotes was enhanced by Maurice Hurley one other thing we haven't talked about is the C plot involving Worf and Dr. Pulaski a a, a plot I'd actually forgotten about until I just saw my notes (laughs) just then I did as well yeah yeah wow Worf collapses and it turns out he's basically got the Klingon version of measles. But because Pulaski saves his honour by not revealing medical details, which, you know, any doctor should be doing, he, he involves her, you know, all these great Klingon ceremonies. The Klingon tea ceremony! <laughs> <laughs> mm. Where, where they, they, they pour nice cups of tea and they drink it. Oh, poisonous tea, though! Grr. Um... Yeah, the Klingons, they're really um they're really hard, aren't they? They have tea ceremonies. I think it's a shame that Pulaski knew that it was poisonous tea. I think it would have been better if Worf just gave her poison tea and she died and then Worf was just like, Oh Oh yeah, it's poisonous to humans. That would have been the funniest thing in the episode. Well, that was a beautifully constructed episode, and I, I think we've said most of what we want to say, but we've got a few odds and sods left, so we'll talk about them in quick fire. Quick fire. When I watched this episode, I laboured under the misapprehension for five minutes or so that Eddie Murphy was in it in a non-speaking role. <laughs> And in hindsight, I I realised that uh, this may have made me the bigger racist than the episode. <laughs> the, the, the title of this episode, um, 
up the long ladder, it derives from the expression up the long ladder and down the short rope, a reference to the gallows in an Irish rhyme. Um, Popularised in the Tommy Mackham song, Are You Ready For A War? I just read that directly from Memory Alpha. So so what exactly is the relevance of using it in this episode? Why do they want to reference the gallows in, in the title to the episode? Why do they want to reference gallows? Um, because it's got Irish people in it. <laughs> so they want to murder them all. And uh, speaking of Memory Alpha, Memory Alpha does claim that one of the most memorable quotes from the episode is this exchange between Riker and Granger. You want to clone us? Yes. Barry Ingham, who, who played Danilo Odell, is probably most famous for being the voice of Basil in Disney film The Great Mouse Detective. It's, it's not one of their best, but you know, it was the 80s. He, he isn't actually Irish. He's English. He died quite recently. So Sorry to break it to you again. Two weeks shy of his 83rd birthday. That's home in... Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. He was in Doctor Who and the Daleks, you know. Speaking about the episode, Melinda Snodgrass remarked, it was intended to be a commentary about immigration because I hate current American policy. I wanted it to be something that says sometimes those outsiders you think are so smelly and wrong-coloured can bring enormous benefits to your society because they bring life and energy. That's what I was going for. Now, my boss at the time, Maury Hurley, who is a major Irishman and leads the St. Patrick's Day Parade? Wait, what? Uh, that, 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 uh, that, that changes things. These are the words of Maurice Hurley. Oh, well, it was a wonderful episode. It had all my favourite things in. Trying to be the old kissing the blanny and drinking the Guinness. It was a wonderful thing. And the old Auntie Mabel, she was in. It was a fan. Oh, and, we, and we met her down there. And she fell down the stairs. And it made just spine. We just spine an injury. But you uh, only did up well and you just got caught on fire. Well, that rounds up another episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Next time we will be watching Manhunt. We hope you will join us then. Remember, you can find us on thespoilist.com or on iTunes. And we're also on Twitter at thespoilist. So, come back. I, I sort of lost my momentum there, I'll be honest. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, well, you buddy, 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 buddy. And we'll see you again if you don't want to catch fire in the day, maybe. And if you can know the sheep down the bed and down the road, well, <laughs> tell him a story, but it, 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 it has got cancer. That's racist. <laughs>specifically remember the episode Manhunt. Is the title referring to a certain somebody's mother hunting for a man? Yes. Oh Christ, do I need to get the gong out?